Hello everyone and welcome to the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. I hope you enjoy the video. In February the 6th, 2023, a disastrous earthquake hit Turkey and parts of northern Syria. The aftermath is catastrophic, with the death toll rising above 40,000 and even more injured and lost. Uh, the human tragedy is staggering and each and every life lost there has a story that was unfortunately untold. Now we as engineers do feel responsible due to the fact that it falls within our scope to make sure that those structures do survive earthquakes and, um, and all those kinds of severe uh, circumstances. Well unfortunately that was not the case in some of the buildings in Turkey and uh, Syria once again, our condolences to the people. However, we are here in civil engineering channel and we want to cover this in a civil engineering lens so that we learn our lessons here and make sure that such a catastrophe never happens again. So, of course, most of the figures shown here are from Wikipedia and there is another source that is a technical report from the NTU, National Technical University of Athens. I will reference that when I reach that position. Okay, so uh, Turkey and this region is actually not new to earthquakes. You can see that those are mul multiple earthquakes uh, measured from 1900 to 2023. Green dots being a little bit more. You can see the magnitude here in Richter scale. And most importantly, some of those earthquakes seem to follow a pattern. You can see that there is some sort of line following here and like this. You can see the earthquake somehow going through a certain line here. Of course, here you have some here have some sort of mess here. I don't know where the lines are. And here too. But you can see that those earthquakes do follow a certain line. And uh, this has a reason actually. The reason behind this is called plate tectonics. You see the region basically sits on some active plates where you have, of course, fault lines between plates. Um, I'll come back to that, but just to tell you that there are some multiple plates and those plates do have interactions within each other, be it converging, diverging, or even transformation interaction. And those interactions do create your fault lines. Those fault lines are basically the uh, boundaries of plates when they interact with each other. The interaction of those plates of course, you might have studied this in engineering geology, creates uh, earthquakes. And you can see that the lines we drew here roughly actually correspond to the lines of the fault lines that we have drawn here, with exception to this, because this seems to be not really following a fault line, as you can see here. Even this was uh, drawn here. All right, so what about this plate? What is plate tectonics, actually? You see, the assumption of plate tectonics is basically that we are floating on lava. That's what I want to say. You see, it's like our little crust that we're living on is floating on a sea of lava. And this sea of lava breaks the crust into multiple plates and moves the plates around so that they interact with each other. Because there is lava, molten lava, and the core that does also move because obviously it's hot and it wants to release this thermal energy. This movement will cause the upper crust to move. Of course, the movement is not equal everywhere in the world, which means that you have at one place the crust moving to the right, left side or right side, another place the crust moving to the left side. What you have here is a collision, and this collision is what would create some energy that was released in one instance as an earthquake. It's not always a collision. The interaction between plates follows different uh, patterns. Convergent plates, meaning that plate number one and plate number two do go to e into each other, you have transform plates, meaning that they slide aside each other, and you have divergent plates, meaning that the plates move, move aside, exposing part of the mantle that plumes up, creating more new ground. So, in other words, parts create matter, parts destroy matter, and parts just move aside each other. To understand the plate tectonics, one needs to check out the earthquakes and the distribution of those earthquakes. Once again, blue being smaller earthquakes, red being more dangerous, you can see once again that those earthquakes do follow a certain pattern as if they are drawing the outlines of plates. Now this might not really give you a full picture, so this is only for 2016 by the way. Those are the earthquakes measured in 2016 only. If you want to get the full picture, here are the earthquakes measured from 1963 to 1998. And I think everybody can see the boundaries of plates now. This region actually is uh, prone to earthquakes, so it's surprising that so many structures got destroyed 
although that region is known to be prone to earthquakes and should follow the correct earthquake codes and earthquake requirements. So is that so? Well, let's take a look. Before we take a look on that, however, we need to understand what earthquakes do to structures. Now, first of all, our structures are flexible. You can design a perfectly rigid structure, but this needs a lot of money because then you would have to invest in the rigidity of your columns and shear walls. Also, being rigid means that you are not um, dissipating the energy. Of course, the structure on the right is rigid in comparison to the left because the left has extra mass. Now, because the structure here is light, the amount of forces generated due to the movement of the ground is small and thus the elements are perfectly capable of carrying those without deflecting. However, when you add some weights here, you can see that the structure is actually struggling to hold its own because of all the forces that they need to basically withstand. Now, this, as you can see, causes some extreme movements that would cause collapse if the earthquake continues for long. Now, if this is a GIF that actually keeps looping, but what happens actually is that this should be falling down. So that's what happens to our structures during an earthquake. And we need to make sure that we are ad we adequately designing the structures. If you take a look on that, you see that the joint region is the region that gets the most uh, attacked by the earthquake. And the columns seem to be those things that are responsible of carrying the loads, as you can see. The columns are the things that do prohibit the structure from failing. The beams, if one beam fails, this will not lead to the destruction of the structure, but if one column fails, this would lead to progressive collapse. Now, uh, there is a lot of codes, and I will try to be code neutral, so I'll just mention the design hotspots that the codes do talk about. Now, the first thing, and please notice those are not listed in terms of importance, the first thing is the connection, which means the connection between the vertical and horizontal elements. The connections should be rigid enough to allow moment transfer, because if the connection is weak, then the structure fails regardless of how big my beam is. If I have a huge beam and a huge column and a weak connection, well, the structure will fail at the weak connection and the beam will basically fall down and the column will fall down. What I'm trying to say is that the structure is as strong as its weakest link. It doesn't matter how powerful all the other elements are. If there is a weak link that cannot be replaced, then the structure will fail at that weak link and doesn't matter how much stuff I put in my beams. Confinement is another, is is another issue. Uh, concrete in any element, for example a column, concrete in a column, well, is subjected to axial forces. Those axial forces want to, due to Poisson's ratio, want to basically expand the, the, the column sideways. Now, this expansion would reduce the strength of concrete under compression, and that's why we put stirrups around the concrete core. Besides carrying shear force, those stirrups also do confine the concrete core, so that if you overload something, the only thing, if you overload a column, it will not fail immediately. The concrete cover will fall off, spalling will occur, and then, of course, the concrete core is exposed with its stirrups. Of course, if you keep overloading, then the stirrups start breaking one after the other, which of course then leads to the core to be destroyed and the column to fail completely. The third thing that we need to design is local failure instead of global failure. This means weak beam, strong column, because we want the column to be stronger than the beam, so that if a failure occurs, the beam would fail, which would cause local failure rather than the column. We also want to have good column to beam connection, I'm saying column to beam, but it also ap applies for column to uh, slab, just saying. Also ductility checks. You want to make sure that uh, your elements are ductile enough to cover a wider range of motion. This wider range of motion is due to the fact that, well, you are in an earthquake-prone region, which means that you have to abide by special requirements of the code. There should be also some reserve in the plastic region to facilitate evacuation. If a structure has, of, has been overloaded and it wants to fail, at least give some reserve in the plastic region so that the structure can basically cut through those reserves before it just fails completely here. Because if you're in the elastic region, you are safe. If you go to the plastic region, then just have some reserves before the structure fails down. Uh, adequate load path alternatives. Uh, meaning that sometimes if something fails, you should be able to have some alternative load paths to allow evacuation before um, destruction, which basically means that we are asking for continuous structures, which once again is about detailing. Now, those pictures are taken from multiple sources uh, with, of course, the input of 
uh, the report of the National Technical University of Athens. This is part A. And it has some pictures and some um, comments on that. So here is a picture. We are paying attention to this now because this is of interest. You can see there is a flat slab and some columns, but I don't see any beams, and the columns seem to be small. This is awkward given that we are in a region of moderate uh, earthquakes. And this is exactly the case. You see, there are no beams, and there are very thin columns, and uh, you will see a lot of buildings if you Google those pictures. You will see a lot of buildings having such small columns for a, a moderately a earthquake region. This is This is... This is strange to be honest. Same thing here, small columns, small columns. Here you can see there is a break in the connection. Uh, I think it's zoomed in also. Let's take a look here, thin, thin beams, no columns. I mean, it's the exact opposite of what we want. We want to have strong columns, weak beams. I see no beams and weak columns, this is the exact opposite. Also, the joints are weak. You can see that the joint has failed completely and the column didn't in this case. Now, it doesn't matter how powerful the column is if the joint fails and the structure fails. That's it. Also here, where are the reinforcement bars? I mean, what? Four bars? Six bars? We are talking about moderate regions. So, it's, it's kind of strange what I see here, to be honest. Furthermore, here, for example, you can see that there is awkward detailing happening here. I'm pretty sure that the slab was like this, continuous, I think, with four columns carrying it. Now, what happens is basically that when the column here failed, uh, now here the, 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 the NTU report talks about being simply supported, but I disagree. What happened here is actually really natural. What happened here is that this broke down and suddenly you had a cantilever action here, which was not designed for. This column broke down, so once again you had a cantilever action here that wasn't designed for. What is strange, however, is the detailing. If we had sufficient steel on top, then uh, this would not be the case, because look at the deflection shape. If you had cantilevers and those two columns failed, the deflection of this middle portion should be upwards, like this. Like, I'm expecting a deflection for the middle region to be upwards, like this. Upwards, not downwards. So I think what happened here is that it switched to a cantilever, the, de the detailing was an inadequate, and it just failed like this. Here, of course, the NTU talks about simply supported. I'm not really agreeing to this, but you see the idea here. I don't think that I don't talk about something else here. Here, uh, there's another thing, small column, and even the, the connection is bad here. The column slips out of plane, and the connection is totally destroyed. There is nothing to be done here. Well, you see, the joints fail as if there is no continuity of the longitudinal reinforcement, and I think that's the case, yes. You see... When you construct your structure, you should have, of course, a column and have a bunch of bars getting out of the column and connect the next column to those bars. Now, in normal, there are normal circumstances for development lengths and so on, but when you have moderate seismicity, you try not to cut your bars near the connection. What ends up happening here is, what I'm guessing, is that the development length was too small and uh, that was basically it. Here uh, you have, well, I see some huge column, but I see no steel. Like, look, what, what do we see here? There is no steel in the center here. This region is entirely empty. Maybe there are two bars here, and there are two bars. This is too low. This is, this is, this is not correct for a moderate seismicity region. Same thing here. I will just speed up because I think we are repeating the same points now. Uh, stirrups are very low here. I mean, look, what's this? This is 5-6 millimeters, just by eyeballing it. And you have here 5-14 millimeters. Like, how can this stirrup provide confinement to this? The idea of stirrups is, if you don't have stirrups and you have longitudinal bars, under compression, those longitudinal bars will bulge out, basically. The job of stirrups is to confine the longitudinal bars and confine the concrete core inside. I see no stirrups here. So, yeah, that's, that's really odd. Uh, furthermore, here, yeah, connection, 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 I think, yeah, there is nothing to be added here. Connection still. Uh, here, yeah, look, that's what I'm talking about. The development length being given here, for example, this one is very small, this one is very small. It's like they don't even care. Like, some of them are good, and some of them are really small. What's this? Is this enough development length? No. So, yeah, and even not all bars are developed. 
that's that's a new thing to be honest. Also all connections. So what else do we have here? Thin column, strong beam. Uh, look at this. I want to talk about this. Here you see that the column steel penetrated penetrated the slab. But how and why? You see, it turns out that the construction here seems to be done as follows. The columns were basically cast, and instead of bending the steel inside the slab because it was the last slab, they just kept it like they just kept it like this in the end. Of course, and the, under any load, those steel bars will penetrate this slab, starting a crack in the slab that will eventually grow to basically destroy the structure. What should have been done is you should take your steel bars of the last column and bend it inside the uh, slab, especially in regions where you have moderate seismicity. Now, that's exactly what was written here. Once again, I don't see beams, I don't see good joints, that's bad. Here, look, a thick slab and a small column. We are saying strong column, weak beam. I see strong beam, weak column. Strong beam, weak column. This is a structure in that disaster region, and this is a structure not in the disaster region. This is how I would design for moderate seismicity. You have drop beams, you have large columns, you have good connections here, the masonry walls are confined, everything checks out on the right side. However, this was unfortunately not done. What was done is this stuff, and this is a catastrophe. Uh, same thing here, joints. You see, it's always about joints. Uh, finally, just because it's interesting, there was one structure we found on the internet where the entire building just bent over. Nothing was destroyed in the building, but it just bent over. Uh, this is soil liquefaction. Uh, I'll just say this is the loss of bearing capacity of the soil on one side in comparison to the other. This is an overturning that happened to the structure. Uh, so yeah, that's basically everything I wanted to talk about. So, bottom line, if you check out the if you check out the pictures on the internet, you will see that it's always connections, confinement, ductility, in, in, in correct ductility. You'll see problems in detailing. So basically, we as engineers, when we design in moderate seismic seismicity, when we design in regions of moderate seismicity, we need to take this stuff into account. I always tell my students that you think that you are just in front of your Excel sheet and getting the steel bars on that. No, we should always keep in our head that we are responsible for the lives of people. If we, my dear engineers, mess up, a catastrophe would happen, and we would also be held accountable, by the way. So, what I'm trying to say is that, well, I hope that, of course, those failure modes uh, let you think a little bit about your work. If you are in a seismic region, then just take it seriously. If you're not, then, well, thank God, it, uh, you ha don't have to deal with this headache. Uh, being in seismic region or not, I think that this discussion is beneficial for you. I hope that this discussion was beneficial for you, and I don't want to say we enjoyed it, because obviously it's a catastrophe. What I'm trying to say is that stay vigilant, uh, abide by the codes. The codes are your life savior. When you abide by the codes then you are protected, because the codes were developed with such circumstances in mind. The codes were developed to, developed to provide the safety you need. If you start disregarding the codes because it takes too, too much time, or because whatever reason, don't. Those codes do save lives, and we are responsible for that thing. That's everything I wanted to talk about. It kind of makes me sad to see all those problems in the structures, but well, now it's history, and now we have to learn from that. Uh, I hope that this video was beneficial for you, and uh, that it was a good learning experience. If it was beneficial for you, then please, of course, like, share, subscribe, and so on. Especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. This is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video.